Thank you. Uh, this is uh, really a work in progress of, of, of being having to receive any comment. This is the very first time that a research project aims to uh, calculate the impact, uh, conservation impact of the Chilean protected area system. We have a pretty old system. I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit more about the system uh, as part of my presentation. So. I, I'm trying to address some of the concerns of Alex in the morning. I think uh, some of the issues uh, I've been trying to work on that, especially things like uh, causal mechanism, par partial identification or causal impacts. So let, let's see how it goes. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll start with a, a, a brief conceptual framework, which is the thing that I've been trying to, to do, like trying to connect a little more theory uh, like building bridges between structural uh, program evaluation and, and, and the more empirical stuff, like the Heckman's goal on, on this combination. Uh, so let's start with something pretty obvious. Uh, so in terms of uh, land, land cover defined by as the biophysical attributes of the land of the Earth's surface and, and land use of the, um, the human purpose uh, uh, applied to these attributes. Land use and land cover changes are by far the most important human frustration, so no, no, no more comments about that. Uh, and especially the dynamics have been very extreme in the last 50 years, as has as been documented in, in many places already. So as a result of these as the huge changes, the demand for land for conservation, but also for other uses like agricultural development, have increased at the same time. So, so this is we are facing double challenges in, in, in that sense. So in terms of the main policy response to these uh, land use and land cover changes, protected areas have by far been the most common conservation policy responses to these changes. So we are spending a lot of money around, around the globe. This is by far, uh, I would say, is the main conservation policy in each country around the world. Uh, so. Um, we are talking about more than 100,000 protected areas around the world, so it's, this is a, a big policy instrument that we are using. Uh, so, well, this is money for nothing, so uh, uh, you, 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 you probably have heard about the polls and surrender paper, uh, so motivation here is exactly the same, so given that the importance of these policy instruments and, and kind of obvious questions, these is this uh, policy instruments work for something, especially to protect natural forests? Um, so uh, the, the, the process of conservation, conservationists uh, and, and policy makers, I would say, are mainly dependent on intuition to, to guide the, the design of these instruments. So really, we really should be evaluating these programs, uh, which is the main focus of the, of the workshop, by the way, at a more fundamental level, I would say, uh, to find out whether, for example, these instruments um, uh, change behaviors, human behaviors, that uh, at the same time affect land use changes. So most of the impact evaluations that we know of protected areas are really a focus on, on what we call monitoring and evaluation. So we just tend to collect the scripted data and, and, and make some rough assumptions about impact comparing protected with unprotected land and see if you find any difference and the difference very quickly are assigned to the to the instrument. So in terms of this specific research, uh, the main research hypothesis is conventional methods to uh, isolate the impact of these programs will tend to overestimate protected areas impact especially when protection is not randomly assigned, which is the case in Chile and probably is the case in any country around the globe. Um, the problem is these are not randomly assigned, but at the same time uh, uh, is, is rather determined by the characteristics that also affect these land use change dynamics. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the main framework, uh, probably you have seen paper from, from Ario and, and Alex that have been using the same. This is a pretty old conceptual model, but it's still, I, I think, by at least in a, in a very static framework, how um, uh, as a social science models, uh, we can simplify very complex, I would say, multidimensional processes, biophysical, socioeconomic, 
uh, and highlights only a few of the many variables of custom relationships involved in, in land use and land cover changes. So this is the, the, the classical continuum model with, in this case, like a macro-regional interpretation on how the, the land use are determined basis, basically on, on land use trends. Um, so keeping in mind this, this conceptual framework, which is a theoretical part to explain land use dynamics, uh, let's move to the theory about the areas in very simple in, in very simple way. So if we if you legally restrict the use or, or, or the access to a specific piece of land, you hope that that's going to decrease uh, uh, land use changes, basically. Okay. Um, but we know because of this is not randomly assigned the, the protection that these protected areas probably are not generating much of the avoided pressure for several reasons, uh, like enforcement, spillovers, but uh, in, in our case, uh, because of this uh, selection bias, when you select uh, or establish protected areas, you are really targeting to low pressure or, or, or low pressure areas, so the low conservation rates. So that's, that's why land use and land cover change dynamics uh, fit very nicely into the conceptual model of the causal or the analysis of the causal impact of protected areas. So this is uh, from Alex, uh, classical paper from 2009. Uh, you, you see that if, if you assign protection, if you assign protection uh, like here, uh, probably you are not going to do a, big, a, a, a good job in terms of um, additionality in conservation because most of these lands are, are going to be protected anyway with or without the, the instruments. And if you are trying to protect here, probably you are going to use all your resources to, to, to protect very, very, uh, very uh, little pieces of land. So really we are talking about the margin here, as, as always in economic, the equal marginal principle is, is in place here also. So, if you will start looking uh, previous analysis, uh, evidence-based analysis of, of protected areas in fact, really uh, very few researches, I have to say, that very few, probably less than five uh, around the, the globe have conducted like empirical studies to test uh, the, the effectiveness uh, of these instruments. Uh, most of these, uh, I would say, uh, beside these five that they are doing it in the right way, the rest are, are most, of, most of them are really failing um, to consider uh, an explicit control for the, for the landscape characteristics that determine these types of land use dynamics uh, to actually uh, uh, control for this selection bias in the establishment of protection. So in terms of uh, most of the, the, the examples you are going to find, so you, you see papers that compare protected zones to unprotected zones, and if you see a difference, you rapidly assign that difference to the protection. So if, if we move to impact evaluation of protected areas, so what, what we really need to do is to collect data to build this counterfactual scenario. So this is the same thing as PSA or the thing that Stefano was talking. Uh, so the, the answer that we, the, the question that we need to answer is how would outcomes have looked like in the absence of, of a problem of policy? So really this, the whole thing about impact evaluation is two things, like selection bias and building this counterfactual scenario. Um, so let, let's talk very briefly about, about, well, I don't think this is, is going to be necessary. It's so obvious that you are already experts on this, so, so let, let's stick to the rest. So. Let, let's move a little bit here that I'm going to talk about partial identification. Let, let, let's, let's, let's present more formally the, 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 the classical, uh, I would say, moving road model of causal effects. So we have outcomes, um, in this case, changes in forest cover. So you have that outcomes for treated and non treated uh, units in this case. So the difference in these two is going to be because of the program. Okay? But the fundamental problem of causal inference is this selection bias. Uh, so first, we, we cannot observe both potential outcomes on the same unit. But we, need, we, 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 can, we can look at, at, at non-protected areas in this case. And on average, we can, we can uh, say about the distribution of the treatment effect over, over the population in, in this case. Okay. So in this case, we are looking at uh, uh, 
changes in forest cover from those areas that are protected and compared with those that are not protected. And addressing the selection bias, so let's say if, if, we are, if we're really uh, focusing on, on, on land with a lower threat of deforestation, for example, uh, the, the potential outcome with, with the treatment is going to be always higher, no, no matter if the, the land is protected or not. So, so this is going to add a, a bias here. So if we compare protected with unprotected land, we're actually estimating the area treatment effect in the tree in this case, but we are also capturing this noise, uh, and this noise is coming from the difference uh, between protected and unprotected areas in terms of, for example, uh, 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 threats of conservation. So what, what is the identification study we are using here? That's pretty standard stuff. So we have potential output, which is our observed changes in forest cover. We are working at the pixel level, so we have a pretty good resolution images uh, from 86 to 2011, and we have pixels protected and, and not protected. So given that we are working at the pixel level, which is the minimum mapable unit, uh, our outcome variable is, uh, is, uh, is binary, so it's, it's either for SA or, or, or not. Um, so a positive sign in this case, you are going to see the results indicate that protection resulted in, in avoided de deforestation. So this is uh, the classical difference in difference approach. Uh, so we have before the establishment in 86 and we got 2011. So the main assumption here in terms of uh, identifying assumption of the method is we have selection of observable. So, so if something is, is affecting protected and not protected that is not observed, it doesn't matter because basically it's affecting the same way both treated and not treated units. So when you t take the difference, the double difference, these, these non-observables cancel out. Okay? That's the main assumption. So let's Let's, let, let me talk very briefly about uh, the Chilean system. So the Chilean system is a pretty, it's a pretty uh, old system. We are doing about almost 20% of the national territory right now is protected by the program. Um, in terms of uh, um, importance at the regional level, we are second in Latin America. The first one is Venezuela. Venezuela is like I don't know, 90% of the country is protected. It's crazy, so we cannot uh, get close to Venezuela. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, so, um, and we run steroids worldwide in terms of percentage of national coverage. So, so it's, it's a pretty significant system. So, this is part of the national community, and these are Araucaria Araucanas. This is our national tree, is protected by law. And this is one of our uh, uh, protected areas. So in terms of uh, this study, uh, so here what, what, what you see in, in, in green are our protected areas. Uh, this, this, uh, this is not the entire country. This is the country where you can find forests. Because given that we are working on avoiding deforestation, I don't want to see the impact of uh, San Pedro de Atacama because it's, it's a better certain <laughs> I'm not going to find any force there. Um, so, so basically, we are talking about this this uh, sample of protected areas. Uh, so basically, this is the data set with that we are using. So it's a it's a, it's a very very detailed uh, uh, set of uh, Landsat satellite images classified by a group of researchers at the University of Concepcion, which is uh, uh, some of the my colleagues that are working on this stuff and it's so complicated I don't want to explain how you can classify some of the images but I can trust that this is a pretty good job. Um, okay so <clears throat> let's start with the, with the classic example of a selection bias. This is a, this is a, uh, a coming paper that's going to appear in land use policy that empirically showing in the case of the Chilean system um, uh, how the, the, the protection is established. Um, so here, uh, probably the result that you are going to get in any place around the world, all these differences are specifically significant. 
You see the classical example, so you know, we are protecting things that are very far from cities, uh, with a, with a, uh, far from roads. Uh, we tend to establish protection in land with very low uh, agricultural potential, so, so basically the only land use alternative that you have in those, in those lands are forests. Um, so uh, you see all, uh, all these are uh, strategic significance. So if we, if we compare protected with unprotected land, we're going to get a difference, right? But well, some of these differences are going to be because of the policy instrument in place. In this case, it's the protected there. But some of this uh, uh, estimate, impact estimate, is going to be because of these differences, right? So if we don't control for these differences, we are going to get biased estimates of protection. So that's why most of the literature that you're going to find in protected areas, uh, they fail in this, in this specific part. They don't control for the selection bias of most of the papers that are published right now in protected areas tend to overestimate the impact of protection. This is a, uh, I, I, I decided to stay with this slide. In Chile, we, our first uh, protected areas is from 1907. So it, we have a pretty old system. Um, but each historical period has been represented by a key policy, like a, a most of the time said it's a law, like a protected area law. And we have been changing the law across the time. So I, I, can, I can identify three historical periods. So uh, in, in, in many conversations with, with, with protected areas administrators, they were, they were telling me that uh, at, at the very beginning, the system started uh, with no criteria to select uh, protected areas. So, Basically, they, they, they decided to protect like beautiful, beautiful places with, with no criteria uh, uh, assigned to that to that selection process. Uh, but as we we start learning, um, our law uh, was uh, was changed. This is the, 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 the main force law from the 1930. This is uh, um, the, the the period that explain when when uh, Chile ratified the, the Washington Convention that uh, include like more sophisticated criteria to establish protection, and this is our current law protected areas that is under revision again in the Congress to see if they change. Um, so you see, in terms of, for example, productivity land um, selection bias looks pretty similar. So in, in terms of like in, in, in inclusion of land opportunity cost to establish protection, it, it seems that that criteria is still not in, playing any role in, in deciding protection. So I don't know what, what we have been learning, but okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so okay, let, let, let's let's talk about some preliminary results. So so um, these are the these are the, the, the main comparison between protected and unprotected land. And you see that if I stick with that number, 17% of the forests have been deforested. If if we uh, if the protected areas were not established. So this 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 will be the impact uh, of, of protection if I just make a comparison. But uh, because we know already that the selection uh, bias is, is, is in the, in the establishment of protected areas, if we correct this bias, look at the impact, right? Then they correct the impact. So now we're talking about between 5, 4, 4 and 6 percent of avoided deforestation because of the, of the establishment of protected areas. So this is the classical example of how a, a, like a typical, typical comparison of protected and unprotected land would tend to overestimate the impact of the policy. Uh, in Chile, this is a nice story, and uh, probably is 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 the one that I'm, I'm trying to get more juice uh, uh, out of this. Um, in Chile, we don't have the, the the practice of expropriation. Like, if you want to establish a protected area, you look only on public land. Okay, so if we want to. Uh, aggregate more units, we need to see uh, uh, the Ministry of, 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 of Bienes Nacionales uh, um, what land is available, okay? So if, if, we, if we use all, only the public land as controls, uh, these are the results. So this is interesting, look at, look at the, uh, the, the simple DID 
Um, here it, it tends to be actually lower than the, 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 the corrected, the corrected uh, impact. So in terms of like uh, bias corrected, we are looking at a very similar results, but the, the story start very differently from the beginning. So it's a, it's, a high, it's a nice story that I need to develop a little more. So the classical bias adjusted example, so we are doing a pretty good job by um, um, correcting uh, unbalance, and actually we're also uh, doing a, a post-matching regression uh, to correct uh, any remaining unbalance during the, the matching process. In terms of the dynamics, uh, because this, these are these are primary results, I'm really looking at this specific transition, okay? But uh, but the data is telling me a, a lot more stuff, so I, I need to look at this because uh, we start with forest, but we are ending, we are we are going to we are finishing with the very different stuff. In some of these we are we are ending we are starting with forest and ending with forest, but in some of these we start with forest. And, 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 we, and we finish with some, some degraded forests, in other cases with agriculture, in, in other cases with forest plantations. Forest plantations is a big issue in Chile. Actually, we, we were talking in, in the break, we have a, a subsidy that uh, pay landowners to, to establish forest plantations. So we have been paying subsidy for, I don't know, 30 years already, and we have actually don't have any evidence on how is the impact of that subsidy subsidy on forest conversion, for example. So people probably are receiving money from the government to cut native forests and plant pines. Oh um, okay. Um, let me finish with, with, with this these are final in terms of uh, baselines, this is always a, a, a nightmare in, in impact evaluation. Uh, in, in my case I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the impact uh, of protection between 86 and 2011, but I have a, I have a lot of protected areas studied way before 1986. So can I can I can I include those without baselines? Well, the, the first answer is no, of course, because how I'm going to correct um, the, 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 the estimates in the uh, baseline, but at least in in in, in a indirect way, I can test if my land use model is good enough to predict baseline forest cover. And actually it's pretty good because if I use only 86 and 2011, okay, so let's say a, a protected area was established in 1990, so I have the baseline for that protected area because uh, I had the 86 image. If I, if, I, if I use the model to predict the forest cover in 86, actually 94% of non-protected areas are covered by forest in 1986. And 95% of protected areas are covered by forest in 1986. So at least in this indirect way, I could use uh, or include in the, in the data, let's say, uh, protected areas established in, in, in 1980 or 75, and I have, I have several of them. So that's it's a, it's a nice way for at least an indirect, an indirect test of how uh, we could do this without basins. Okay, and this is the, this is the let me see. <laughs> this is a, this is a, uh, this is something that Alex talked in, in the morning. And so it's, 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 it's becoming very very unproductive uh, to 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 run into this kind of analysis and provide an ATD estimate and say that this is significant, it's positive, it's negative. Okay. So from from the policy perspective, and if you are thinking about policy recommendations, instead of, instead of providing this single estimate. Uh, probably calculated based on a bunch of econometric assumptions, probably it's better to use the data and, and try to provide like a range of results, okay? And this is what uh, the partial identification with minimal assumptions coming from Charles Mansky is talking about. So, so if, for example, if our, our causal model is not good enough to control for, let's say, unobservables, uh, Mansky would, 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 would provide bias estimates of everything, right? Um, so, so if, if we can sort of like isolate these, these, these things using like minimal assumptions and not, not go into, into too deep on, on the econometrics, uh, we can, we can uh, uh, invocate this partial identification with minimal assumptions. So, for example, if we have no assumptions, so it's like the data is telling us what to do, 
Okay, so, so it's, we, we don't know, we, we, don't, we don't need like more fancy econometrics to, to solve the problem. So, so given that this is a binary variable, our, our, our range of estimates of impact cannot be greater than one or less than minus one, of course. Um, so the maximum error treatment effect will be, will be one if this did happen, it will be minus one if this happened, okay? So uh, this, this is a nice quote. Uh, uh, this, is, this is what I was calling, I was calling uh, in the morning. It's, 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 it's much better to be roughly right than exactly, exactly wrong, okay? Um, so in terms of, of, the, of, the, of the bounding that I'm using here, given that we are talking about the function of public land, so public land is the one that provides a potential land for protection. I can invoke this monotone treatment in response, and, and the monotone treatment selection is coming from this selection bias, and targeting very low, low, low deforestation trees or low conservation uh, risk areas. So, here is, the, here is the result. So I'm looking at, at, at a final impact that is 0.59, so 6% of all the deforestation. But this, this is the range that I, I will provide to the, to the policy to the policy guy in order to, to, to make uh, suggestions about, about this. Um, so conclusions. So. Um, I'm really very interested in seeing this Barcelona declaration, but I would say that some of these things should be in this declaration. Uh, so let me work, much of what is called evaluation of environmental programs is just simply monitoring of, of outcomes, okay? So counterfactual thinking is essential to draw in inferences about program effectiveness. Uh, actually, especially because uh, if you, if, you, if you use uh, uh, behavioral economics, for example, to explain an outcome, and, and probably Evan is going to talk tomorrow about that, it's pretty hard in a conceptual framework to uh, yield predictions about impact. So you need to, to, to think in, in, in a counterfactual way to combine theory with, 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 with the impact evaluation. Um, and this is especially hard because uh, Advancing counterfactual thinking uh, through experiments or quasi experiment. Here we are facing the same barriers that exist in other social policies, but I, I, I strongly believe that these barriers are especially pervasive in environmental policy. So, so our, our mission is, is even tougher. Um, this, is, this is, I guess, what, what, what Alice was mentioning in the morning uh, uh, also trying to build bridges between like more structural uh, uh, program evaluation um, to actually isolate the impact of policies. Uh, this is a Heckman papers in 2010 that made that call. Uh, in terms of this specific uh, project, the uh, protective area may not be converted because of the classical explanations. And for the Chilean case, we actually showing a very strong selection bias when assigning protection. Um, so, in terms of conservation additionality, we could doubt uh, about the effectiveness of this program, which is, by the way, one of the oldest in, in Latin America. So, standard practice always will tend to overestimate um, the impact. Um, so, next step, well, I have several next steps, but some of them are focusing a little bit on impact heterogeneity uh, and causal mechanisms. So as we build more data, because that's the problem, program evaluation, most of the, of the methods are very data hungry and we, when you have very strong data limita limitations, uh, um, it, it, it is a problem. So we, we are working on that. This is a two year project and we spend most of the time like, building the data, the data set. Okay, that's it. Thanks a lot, Diego, for this result.